I now have the privilege of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Ebenezer Yamoa. He is um, also a professor of otolaryngology, or ENT, at UC Davis School of Medicine, and he also does his research at the UC Davis Center for Neuroscience. He also has published ex extensively on topics related to the genetics and the cellular mechanisms, especially of congenital hearing loss. And he is currently conducting research that has truly critical key implications for rehabilitating severe cases of hearing loss. As many of you know, Dr. Yamoa was awarded one of CIRM's first um, seed grants for his promising work with the goal of using stem cells to restore inner ear cells. The ones that uh, Dr. Doyle mentioned are responsible for our ability to hear sounds and appreciate uh, speech. I have more to say about you, Ebenezer. Specifically, he is looking at the differentiation of hair cells and spiral ganglion nerve cells. And these are the cells, and he's going to explain this to us, that are responsible for receiving the vibrations of fluid in the inner ear and sending those signals to the brain uh, where we can hear voices and music. And more than 50% of patients with hearing loss suffer from degeneration of those hair cells. So his work truly holds the potential to help vast numbers of people. We hope that his research will lead to a biologic implant um, that restores hearing. And unlike the cochlear implants that Dr. Go Doyle mentioned, this would preserve the structure and function of the sensory cells and the nerves of the uh, inner ear. So very exciting. He has already discovered adult and embryonic stem cells that kind of resemble those inner ear sensory cells. And he has begun the research on embryonic stem cells that are the progenitors of hair cells. Um, uh, he is a member of the Biophysical Society, the Society for Neuroscience, the Association for Research in Otolaryngology, he has a whole long list of uh, credentials, but I think the important point is his research, so I will turn the podium over to Dr. Ebenezer Yamoa. I think we can, we can go home now. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll be talking to you about how hearing works in the inner ear. And I've got a f two basic announcements before I go ahead. Um, we've been trying to look at how we can regenerate inner ear hair cells. And the reason being that we've got about 10,000 hair cells in, uh, in the inner ear when we are born. But when they begin to degenerate, they are terminally differentiated, so we cannot in any way uh, get them to actually restore themselves or regenerate. So the idea is to be able to find foreign cells that have got the properties of hair cells and then hopefully implant them in the inner ear to form what we call biological implants. Before I go ahead, I would like to uh, draw your attention to the fact that I want the talk to be quite engaging, so please feel free to stop me anytime when you don't uh, hear something. Uh, uh, what I will also do is that um, I don't usually have difficulty explaining things, but I will repeat whatever I say in different crescendos, and you ultimately you will hear what I'm talking about. Okay, the other thing that I would like to also mention is the fact that uh, the support that we've been getting is from the state of California, and we are very grateful for our members of the state of California. Uh, these are the people who actually, whose hands and brains made the work that I'll be talking about happen. Uh, in another uh, scenario to the National Institute of Health, Deafness Research Foundation, as well as the National Organization for Hearing Research supports work in my lab. I must also single out Dr. Claire Pomeroy as being very supportive and showing remarkable, uh, uh, unrelenting uh, efforts in making sure that we are supported and also making sure that we are kept at UC Davis. Okay. Before I go ahead, I would like to talk briefly about um, some of the motivations that actually drives us to try to understand how hearing happens, if you like. First of all, 
as you all know, we can hear sound in the order of about 20 kilohertz. That is 20 cycles per second. 20,000 20, cycles per second. If you compare it with the hearing of, say, bats or whales, whales can hear up to about 100 kilohertz. That is 100,000 cycles per second. So hearing is truly a very fast event. And it's quite extraordinary in terms of speed. Let's take, for example, uh, vision. If you see an image 50, about 30 cycles in a second, or 30 times in a second, you will see it as a continuum. And that is the basic principle for television and motion pictures. But in the case of hearing, you can actually hear something that is about 1,000 times that uh, fast. So hearing is clearly a very remarkable event. And in, in most, most cases, I consider it that's the fastest sensory modality that we have. So the speed of hearing is relatively uh, fast. Another uh, feat of uh, hearing is that if you consider the motion in which the inner ear can detect, it is in the order of about one-tenth a nanometer. That is the size of a medium-sized atom. So the thing we usually ask ourselves is that how can something that is made up of lipids and protein be able to actually sense high frequency and also motions of that nature. The other uh, technical quality of hearing is that there is, it has a broad range of sensitivity. We can hear up to about zero decibels, up to about 120 de decibels. That is comparable to an airplane taking off. In that particular case, but we should also remember that Loud noise is also destructive. OK. The second uh, motivation is a clinical one, in which Karen has talked about briefly. Um, about 100 of these hearing loss arises from about um, genetic, if, uh, genetic defects. The other component also is what we call uh, syndromic hearing loss. That is, it, it, not only, uh, it not only affects hearing, but it also affects, say, vision, as well as the kidney as well. OK, so another component of hearing loss, or the source of hearing loss, is infection. Uh, a case in point is meningitis, as well as rubella. And the main target for these hear, uh, infection is the hair cells that I will be talking about. Drug-induced hearing loss is also very common. In fact, these are legitimate drugs, uh, antibiotics, uh, cisplatin, which is actually a very common drug used for ovarian cancer, uh, appear to tend these uh, hair cells. Acoustic trauma is also a major one. If you live in a place, uh, a city like Sacramento or San Francisco, you always come across buses and people as well. And they all generate enough sound for, for them to begin to uh, cause damage to the inner ear. The, third, the, the fourth event is age-induced hearing loss. Usually, they call it presbycusis. And literally, it is the hearing of old men. And I'll also talk briefly about how it comes about. Of course, the psychological impact and the financial impact of this is relatively high. And a typical example is something that Helen Keller once said, that blindness cuts us off from things, but deafness cuts us off from people. The very common things that we do as we talk to people in the hallways and also interact that defines our human intercourse is truly defined by our ability to communicate through sound. Luckily, the main target for most of our hearing loss are these hair cells. They reside in the inner ear, and they have these projections, which are form something like an antennae that senses sound as it enters into the inner ear. And these are the cells that we are trying to remake, if you like. 
So what I will do now is to show you a brief one, uh, hearing 101. That's about uh, one minute. That will give you an idea as to what I will be talking about. So the inner ear, as you saw in the cochlea, as if you unwind it, is laid out in a fashion such that the base of the cochlea responds to high frequency noise, whilst the tip, uh, the apex of the cochlea responds to low frequency noise. And anything in between uh, is shared among uh, the various frequency. And this is the principle in which we call tonotopic arrangement of the hair cells in the inner ear. In the lab, we are unable to play this music. So what we do is that we isolate these cells and put them in a dish and then vibrate the bundle in a manner in which sound also stimulate them. So we move this at different frequency and in response to that, we record various electrical activities in the cell and to actually learn how it actually functions. Unfortunately, when uh, we are in our younger age, ages, we've got almost all the 10,000 hair cells made up of three rows of outer hair cells and one row of inner hair cells. As we reach our 50s, we begin to lose plenty of them. And by 80, uh, there's little or no uh, inner ear hair cells. There's a secondary effect of uh, loss of hair cells as well. Apart from losing the hair cells in this area, since these hair cells release promoting signals into the neurons that are in this temporal bone, once you begin to lose hair cells, the spiral ganglia neuron, that is the released uh, neurons that connect hair cells to the brain, also begin to degenerate. So the goal really is not only to replace these hair cells, but also to fill these bones with neurons. So we, we are attempting to try to identify embryonic stem cells as well as adult neural stem cells that have got these capabilities. That is, they have this specialized uh, antennae, if you like, or stereocilia. They are usually made up of about 50 to 60 of them, and then they have got all these structures that allow them to be mechanically sensitive. In addition, not only do we want them to look like hair cells, but we want them to express proteins that are characteristics of hair cells. So the goal is to essentially, as outlined here, is to identify these cells allow them to, or to convert them or to get them to differentiate into, into inner hair, ear hair cells and neurons, and then also to make sure that even in culture these, these cells are functional before we will begin to restore them into the inner ear. What we've done, what I show here are stem cells that we have uh, plated in culture dish that, have, that forms what we call cell, uh, stem cell spheres. By using the different cocktails of agents, we are, we've been successful in beginning to get these cells to differentiate into cells that look like hair cells. Indeed, they express myosin 7A. That is the main protein that is a signature protein for hair cells. In addition, they begin to grow uh, appendages that have uh, features that are similar to that of hair cells. We've also identified a group of stem cells that also have the ability to communicate to the spiral ganglia neurons. These, the small cells are the stem cells, and the bigger ones are the native spiral ganglia neurons. In culture, these cells make connect, uh, legitimate connections between each other, 
and they also begin to express proteins that are characteristics of synapses, that is the point in which neurons make contact. Functionally, when we put electrodes into these cells, the sparaganglia neurons as well as the stem cells, we begin to elicit signals, electrical impulses that look like the ones that we normally record when we record from hair cells as well as uh, sparaganglia neurons. The next thing we've done is essentially create an inner ear in a tissue culture. That is, we isolate the entire cochlea. This is showing you all the inner hair cells. And then we kill the sparaganglia neurons and place seeds of uh, neural stem cells on the opposite side, and then to see whether they can grow fibers that will make connections with hair cells. A blown up image of this is shown here, where you see these nerve fibers coming in and making uh, synaptic contacts with these hair cells. Again, we can still put an electrode into these neurons, stimulate the hair cell, and also record signals from, uh, from the uh, neural stem cells, indicating that, in fact, the marriage between the neurons and hair cells appear to be functional. So what I've indicated to you is that there appear to be hope, at least in culture, that we can identify a certain group of cells that can integrate uh, with hair cells, forms matured or functional synapses. And then uh, the next step is to be able to try to see whether, in fact, other subtle properties that hair cells and neurons also have can also be uh, mimicked in this tissue culture. The ultimate goal is to make sure that we can actually um, grow these cells, as I showed it in green, inject them into the inner ear, and hope that they will incorporate themselves into the temporal bone as well as into uh, sites where hair cells are lost. Uh, this is just an example of a case where usually when you run a lab in which uh, you've got a lot of alpha postdocs, they usually go ahead and make, do experiments without telling you. <laughs> this is an experiment in which one of my students uh, went in and essentially injected some of these green cells into a mouse. And two weeks later, he, she came back and told me that she's got it incorporated into the temporal bone. This is certainly uh, not uh, the case, but it appears as if there are good signs that we'll be able to inject these cells into the inner ear. And I will stop here.